And that Instagram is uh, Striker HBHS. Has all my kids stuff on there. It doesn't have any of my stuff, and I don't really have any of my stuff online to look at. But this is a, just a sampling of some of the things I do. Um, feel free to come up and carry this stuff around and, and, and hold it and look at it. And by the way, this is Christy. If you know, haven't met Christy yet, Hi, Christy. Christy's my girlfriend. Yay! And she is probably more skilled to be up here doing this than I am. <laughs> Um, so I'll do some wheel throwing stuff, but any um, any ideas that you have, if you want to see something, just let me know, and I'll, and I'll give it a shot. And if I can't do it, Bill can do it, wherever Bill is. <laughs> <laughs> Bill's taught me a lot of the stuff that I'm doing today. Um, so the first thing I was going to try is, um, do you guys, have you ever heard of that, that Japanese technique, Kiranoki? Kiranoki? Kiranoki box? I don't know. So um, it's a traditional technique of carving a piece out of a solid block of clay and, and texturing the outside to look very natural and, um, and they kind of look like, like, like stone. And we, at school we do them into boxes and we do them oh. into like succulent plants. So you can like hold out the whole in succulent. Lovely. Yeah, cool. Kurinuki box. What's the name again? Uh, Kurinuki, it's K-U-R-I-N, Kurinuki, U-K-I, I believe. Um, and the, the, the great thing about it at school is, at the end of the year, kids like leave clay in their lockers when they're supposed to ah. clean them out. And so then, at the beginning of the next school year, I have all these bags of clay that are like, you know, really kind of stiff. And that's a perfect starting point for doing this Kiranuki thing. Um, with really soft clay, it's a little more tricky, you know, it's kind of like squishy. You want, you want to kind of be able to do things to these that are, like, you're going to be pretty rough on the piece of clay. So, this one... Sometimes I'll keep it in the bag, and I'm gonna. You just want to texture the outside to look natural, rough. Um, you know the whole like wabi sabi philosophy. Mm -hmm. It's kind of along that, those lines. So like you know you could take the edge of your table and some of that. To get started. So I tell kids to just like take these outside and just throw them around and kind of get a, a starting point where it's got some interesting things happening. Out of the bag. And then you kind of look at it and decide, you know, which side is going to be up. Maybe kind of like that. You should probably do that. <laughs> so far, are we on board with this? <laughs> and um, like outside, if there's like a manhole cover or a grate or something, those are great for just throwing the block down on, and then you get interesting Tree. designs and textures. Trees, yeah, all kinds of things. Um, stick. Like that. Say, we'll say this, it's going to go this direction, so we'll call this up. Kind of some repeating things. So it's pretty rudimentary to start. And I try to tell people to, like, instead of, like, carving, which leaves kind of a, like, a rough line, everything is kind of pressed in, which gives a, a softer, more natural kind of look mm -hmm. to it. If you have any ideas, shout them out if you think, oh, go try doing this or this or this. Okay, and then um, I'll take like, take a wire tool and maybe cut across steps like that. If you have a wiggle wire, those are cool too. Doing this on a banding wheel would probably make. Oh, the banding wheels are right behind you. Oh, we have some heavier ones. Uh, these are good. Kind of 
look at it and think, no. Get in here a little bit. So I could use a little something. So then if it's going to be a um, if it's going to be an open planter, you'll just get your trimming tools and start scooping into it. If it's going to be a box, should we do a box or a planter? A box. box. Okay, this box. <laughs> so decide where the lid's going to come off. So maybe I'll start here, come across. And then you don't want to just cut straight because then you know it's going to slide off. So give it a little bit of a, a design. Yeah. This is where you want your clay to be like as stiff as possible because when you're moving this around now, it's going to distort. So then it's a matter of figuring out. So where you're going to be scooping everything out. So, I would recommend. Oh, did everyone see the eclipse? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, somebody was out there taking a picture of it. If they hadn't been doing like that, I would have never even thought to look it up. So ideally, I would put this out in the sun or give it time to dry more so by holding it isn't, you know, affecting the, the designs. But we'll pretend that I did that. And then a general rule that we use at school at least is um, nothing can be thicker than like the bottom of your thumb so it doesn't blow up in the kiln. Is that kind of the, the guidelines basically that you guys? Guidelines? Yeah, I think we say it has to be less, less than an inch. Really? I never heard that. Put that back on there and just, and let, it just let it dry a little bit, yeah. Cool. So it would be a lot of that you know do that more and then same thing on this side so kind of dry. and then when you're doing this when you're carving down into this you really have to pay attention to what you've done to the outside because if it scoops outward you have to go down and then scoop outward with your tool to follow the contour of that of the, the pot itself And then glazing these, um, you know, glazing the inside and leaving the outside raw is really a good idea. Uh, you can also do a wash of oxides, like iron oxide on it, and then sponge it off so you get the oxide down in the nooks and crannies of it. We built a, um, a soda kiln, actually Christy built a soda kiln at school. And so these things, when they go into soda kiln, they pick up all kinds of really great designs. You guys, everyone knows what a soda kiln is? So a soda kiln, oh there we go, yeah. A soda kiln is um, you, when the, you put your pieces in with no glaze on them or just a liner glaze on the inside and then heat the kiln up to cone 10, 2380 degrees and then at that temperature you spray, you introduce um, some sort of uh, sodium material, baking soda or soda ash, um, so we'll use baking soda and you can you can mix it in a, a garden sprayer and spray it into the kiln or you can throw it in. Some people make little burritos and paper and they toss them in the kiln and when the soda hits that 
hot air, it immediately vaporizes and it attaches itself to anything that has silica in it. So the clay has silica in it, the shelves have silica, the bricks have silica, and it turns to a glass, it turns to a glaze. So you spray it in the kiln <coughs> and it just randomly just glazes your piece and it catches any little, so this went in the kiln with no glaze, this was just bisqueware. And then it comes out like that. So this side got more soda, this got a little less, and then you get these toasty kind of orange places that just get a little bit. So it's like, it's a great fire so, truck. What happens? Yes. I just want to say, Saddleback College just built a soda kiln. Mm -hmm. So if you take a course of Saddleback, I expect that you'd be able to use it if you wanted to try this. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, question. What yes. if you use the uh, glaze on the outside? What would happen? If you like glaze the outside of this? Mm -hmm. You could do that. Okay. I mean, like a um, different effect. Different effect, um, and depending on the glaze, you know, you, I wouldn't, I would tell people not to just dip it in like a black glaze, you know, but something that's gonna, gonna kind of show off your designs, mm -hmm. um, like a, a chino, carbon trap chino would be nice. Okay. A celadon would show all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you could also, um, like, say I dipped it in, I, say it was made out of a dark clay, and I dipped it in a light glaze, like even a white. Mm -hmm and then sponge it off so it just it glazes in all your little nooks and crannies, but then the surface of it is more just rock clay. Mm -hmm. That looks really good. What do you think, Christy? Yeah. That's so pretty. So that's a carbon trap chino with black stain kind of painted on and then sponged off. Very nice. Uh, Can I speak in there? Yeah. So. <laughs> kind of like working your way down like that and then another interesting thing I think on these instead of having them just sit flat on the on the um, surface create negative space under the whole thing so you could take out and again I would um, to lay it on its side like this I would definitely want it more more um, leather hard and probably lay it on, on a piece of foam or something. But the idea here is I'm going under it. So it would eventually sit up with some, um, some negative space going underneath. Can everyone please turn off your cell phones? Just like being at school. <laughs> and I love your announcement that you're meeting about cleaning up. <laughs> the world I live in. We're going to send her over to the high school for you. <laughs> is that there's kids who are 17, 18 years old who apparently have never learned how to use a sponge. <laughs> they will load a sponge with water and then just walk across the <laughs> Somehow they just never... <laughs> oh, yeah, all the kids. <laughs> so, instead of boring you, just watching me carve this thing out. Does that kind of get you the general idea of how you can make one of these things? So you go down and really like get in there and, and test your thickness. And then... Um, that one, and then you would fire them together in the bisque kiln. Fire it just like that. Just like that in the bisque. And then if you're gonna glaze the inside, you know, glaze it, except leave that all unglazed on the court on the edge. And I would and I would glaze fire them together because if you high fired it separate, they would they would warp and then they wouldn't go back together. Tell me once again what this is called. Uh, Kiranuki, K-U-R-I-N-U-K-I. -I, I believe. Got a slab. You can go right on the table if you want. I'm just worried it'll stick to that. Does it? Does it stick to these tables? Yes. This is yes. what? what? It's not the mix. It's the other yeah. white, stony yeah. white. Yeah. Stony yeah. white. Yeah. You'll be all right on the table. Oh well. Yeah. Okay. That's a great rolling pin. And Stony White's an art bar clay? No. That's a Laguna?
Somebody was just telling me yesterday at Laguna Clay, have you been to that place? It's enormous out in the city of Minister or something. But all those Pacifica wheels and stuff, they actually manufacture those there. And they make, um, they obviously they make all their own clay and they have these, the mixing machines that, that mix this clay, I guess they're enormous compared to the ones at Arbor. They're like two stories high, <laughs> just huge. So for like a little sushi plate, I'll take something that's square. Or you can do a rectangle one too, I guess. Um, and I lay it down on the clay, and then I take a ruler, and I'm going to use the ruler as the thickness. I'm going to make a border around this block that that wide. So I'm going to lay that down there, and then the pin tool. Is there a pin tool anywhere that I can use, or the knife? Oh, I have a knife. I use that. I'm going to cut the border around it what is a sushi <laughs> a sushi style plate square instead of a round plate it's a hand built with the little raised edges plate oh, yeah, yeah i thought it was blade oh <laughs> sorry. oh that's interesting <laughs> Okay, so I've got my slab of clay, I put it on the foam, and then I'm gonna center this in the middle of the slab. Is that about a quarter inch? The, the slab? Yeah. About a quarter inch, yeah. And then you just give it a push. And you get a medium. Oh, that's too easy. <laughs> So if your clay's really soft, it's going to want to flop right, like that, especially right. like holding it. So I'll just take a little coil, give it a little support while it dries. Um, you do put a foot on it. So when it's leather hard, I mean, you have an option. You could, when it's leather hard, you could put a coil foot around the, the base of it, you know? Um, I see some people put little balls of clay, but sometimes then it just warps in the kiln. So it's like a continuous slab, or I mean, a continuous coil foot is probably the best way to go. And we could, um, I'll put this outside. And, and then for the end of the demo, it'll be leather hard enough. We'll bring it in and, and do a foot on it. And then maybe even like um, scraffito. Does there, everyone knows what scraffito is? Yeah. So scraffito is, that's white clay. You would take a colored slip, like a black slip, paint it on the, the whole thing when it's leather hard. And then when it's dry to the touch, you can carve through it and everything you carve is white because the clay's white and everything you don't carve is the black background. Mm -hmm. And if you look up Scorpino online, I mean, there's people that just do incredible stuff. And the, um, the, the way I like to teach it at school is like kids who say, I can't draw, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm <coughs> you know, impossible to draw. You don't have to be like, you could, you can print out a little, um, mm -hmm. like a silhouette of something or a template and then lay it on your clay and then you, you draw on the paper with a ballpoint pen, and when you peel the paper off, you'll see your little dents that went through. Mm -hmm. So you can do really intricate designs and make it seem like you can draw really well, but you're really just tracing on a piece of paper. And then when you carve through the graffito, it comes out really nice. So we can try that. So I'm gonna make, I'll make another one of these, and then we'll put those out in the sun. Oh, and for the, um, if you eat sushi, you gotta have a, where's my little block? So um, for your soy sauce and your wasabi and all, you do the same thing, you do a little rectangle one. So this one I kind of just freehand around it.
I'm going a little premature. Give it some Preston designs, kind of sim similar to the Hiranuki box. So that, and I mean anything that you can find, will give interesting textures. School, we make um, kids make little stamp bit stamps for doing designs. Which is a fun project because then you get a big bucket full of like stamps to, to choose from. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now that you have your, your designs on a thick slab, you can stretch the slab and kind of open up all those designs. So if you throw it sideways, it starts to open all that up. distorts the, the patterns you make. Mm -hmm. And then maybe you want to take that and turn that into a cylinder or something. So you could... Kind of strip out of that. Make it actually straight. So if you were going to build a, a mug or something, like that, would that make a good, interesting mug? <laughs> So a whole set of those. I mean, you could just do mm -hmm. endless, you know, interesting designs with that. And then again, like carbon trap chino or something on there, or a celadon would look really interesting. Or oh, maybe an oxide wash. An oh, well, oxide wash would be great. Yeah, yeah, glaze on the inside. <coughs> And I'm kind of assuming, like, everyone knows scoring and slipping and all that yeah. stuff and how to build these things. So if you, like, it would take me a while to, like, build this into a little mug, but everyone, I assume, gets the idea of, you know, like a slab on the bottom and cut it out. And, and I'll show you how I make um, handles, like, like a good functional cup handle. There's the... Um, you can do it right. If you're just hand building a handle and you don't, you're not going to be pulling a handle at the sink. You can roll a coil. It's like tapered, and then roll it into a little carrot, like that. 
and then just throw it on the table and then throw the back side on the table. So you've got your two round edges so it's comfortable to hold and you've got your two flat edges and then I'll cut it at an angle away from me like that and then that part sits on the table and then it rolls into a question mark like that to you. Make it look so charming. <laughs> 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 I used to be able to clap in the class. Unless they really want an A in the class. <laughs> so clap. <laughs> okay, and then. Um, so this, yeah. So this one is kind of a combination of hand building and throwing. So I did what I just did for that on a slab, and I used. I think that's from like a um, there's a grate outside of school, like a drainage grate, and I threw the clay down on that, and then did some things, and then stretched it out, and then I put that slab on the wheel and made this this dish out of it. So do you want to see one of those? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> I do a lot of, um, I don't think I have any here, but I do a lot of little little handles on pots, especially like when we get on the wheel. If you have just a vase and it's like, okay, it's a nice vase, put a handle handles on it, all of a sudden it's like, it just elevates it to a different world. Yeah, yeah handles make all the difference. And I'll show you while I'm still thinking of it. Sometimes I'll take little coils Make little spikes out of them. And I'll take this guy. And do it on the same side. So you can roll this design into your little spikes. And then I'll do it on foam so when I roll the other side, it doesn't destroy the design. Like that. And then you can do like little little loop-de-loops, like that, and cut those level, and then if you have just a, a little vase, I think it just it totally makes like things it's way more interesting with some sort of little decorative thing going on coming off the side. <laughs> Veteran Stadium um, swap meet, it's like the vintage swap meet. Yeah. And I guess these are they're like really old and they're for fabric, fabric. yeah. Oh. yeah. For wallpaper. Oh yeah. That is tomorrow, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll stretch this out. <laughs> Break it, you buy it. I just, I just love how it distorts when you do the stretching thing. It's super interesting. Like that alone as a tray, like if you if you slump that over like a mold and then put feet on it, like like little 
stand up feet, that'd be a great tray, I think. Yeah. yeah. And it made that little rim around the outside. Have molds behind you if you want to. Oh, yeah. yeah. The bigger one. Do you have a concave one? Okay, inside. Yeah. Like something like. There's this one. That one. Like if it's set up and you kind of like dropped it in. Or a wider mold would be kind of cool. So you kind of get the idea of like what that would do. Yeah. I'm going to do the. Um, yeah. We do have some, they're probably just hidden. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, so then this would go on a mat. So, bigger bat. That, that'll go on the wheel. But before we do that, um, there's another thing I do at school called a called a fossil base and the idea is you build your piece on the inside of a form and you trap you fossilize things between the form and the clay and then as the and then, so you build it in there and as the clay dries it shrinks and pulls away and you take it out and then you have this this just random outside surface and you can turn it into a jar or a vase or anything like that so we do them with these tubes and, and doing different colored clays, I think is very interesting to do. So I'll take, and you can do this inside of the, these cardboard tubes. You can, you can build, I've done it with um, building like a wooden box with wood screws. So then you can just unscrew the whole thing and take it apart, and then you have a square version of this. Which, from my description, you probably have no idea what it looks like. It all makes sense. So the um, the things I would much better. Um, Could we ask her to come and work in our studio? Right? Yeah. I like what she does. Yeah. She's good. I hope you pay her well. No comment. Clever man. She's smiling. So, Gary, that, that fleet with the uh, wheel portion in the middle, is mm -hmm. there a name for it? Technique for that, or what is that? Yeah, I don't know. I just made that up. <laughs> Come up with a good name for it. Let me know. And this one, I have a little hanger on the back, so it's just like a wall decoration. Okay, so I usually will do these just with random pieces of clay. Sometimes I'll tear them to get a like an interesting edge. And the fossil idea is. Like maybe I want to fossilize a wood screw, so I'll lay it in there, and then I lay that down, and now that's in my wall. Well, be careful when you're ready to fire. Right, yeah. <laughs> Make sure that stuff is out. Oh, yeah. I mean, sometimes I'll leave it in and let and just let it burn right into the into the pot, and I think our technician would kill us. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've done this with cones too. I'll fossilize the, the cones that go in the kiln. And then they kind of just, a cone 10 at cone 10 just looks like a little glass cone. If you do a lower cone, they kind of melt and pour out the side a little bit. Um, and, not necessarily. And a lot of it is um, plants. I'll, I'll just pick branches and flowers and rocks and, rocks and things oh, and, and lay them in there and then you get you can get you know all these like um, like what is it the uh, the herb um, rosemary? rosemary yes thank you mm -hmm. so rosemary is really pretty in there see it really it's stiff so it presses into the clay like most flowers are too thin and they kind of disappear but um, 
like rosemary, things like that, twigs. Um, string is kind of interesting. Some sticks in there. Do some popsicle sticks. Whoops, whoops. I tried. Thank you. The angels don't want me. <laughs> and I don't want the Dodgers. Fight words. Uh, let's see here. Stick in there. And I've done, um, you can take hot glue and then glue, like hot glue a design on the inside of your, your form, and then the clay will get all that that's design pressed into it. What we have here also is different colored uh, glass shards. Oh, yeah. Different. Yes, that would be perfect. Like, like, kind of ground up. Uh, yeah, really so, just to show you what is happening here, so fast forward, your piece is rather hard, and it has shrunk, and it's popped out of here. You want me to dry that a little bit? I think it will pop out of here. So the outside has these things, you know, fossilized into it. And then I like using just, just random slabs of clay because then you get all these seams where the clay's overlapping and it's not just a completely smooth, you know, homogeneous surface. And then like, when it's fire, you end up with that. If you, if you remove this, if not, you, you end up with like a screw in the side of your thing. Um, you can also take like thread and things and kind of like string them around inside of there but tack them on with um, with glue and then when it dries then you can press it on there so you can kind of prepare the inside of your mold first you could glue things in there get them all set and then just start packing clay inside of it and then you would put a, a slab bottom on it you could you could throw a top to it and and when it's leather hard put it on there so now you have a bottom your cylinder with all the textures on it and then a thrown top which looks really nice um, you can cut them to make them lidded jars stuff like that but does that kind of make sense the, the way that like, yeah. you would mm -hmm. put that together so that's the fossil fossilized base something like that consistency of them how soft they are and this one's really dry or really hard and that one's really soft but i think we can make it work so if you're going to do this, oh, sorry. Oh, and the phone. The phone. So um, when you do this, um, you want to cut these in sections. And when you put them together, you want to do it in a way that's not going to trap air in between them. Yep. So I'm... I'm putting these together so air doesn't get trapped in them, and I want to cut them in sections so when I do put them together, I'm not trapping an air bubble in there. Like and you don't want to wedge your clay when you're mixing the, the, the two clays together because you want, when it's done, you want to have real, like, stark divisions between the colors and if you wedge it now then it just becomes kind of a muddy mess a little more black okay so some people that will do this technique will take this ball of clay, wrap it really tightly in plastic and let it sit for weeks so that the two clays can even out in, you know, in the moisture content. We're not gonna do that. <laughs> Stick it down, I put a little clay in my water to make it sticky and then put four little chunks over here. And I'll kind of go over like how I throw, um, and it, I've been doing this for you know decades. But anytime I get a chance to watch somebody else throw, I do it for sure because everyone does a little little things different, and I always pick up 
little tips when I watch other people throw. So I'll kind of go over some things and feel free to ask me any questions. And I've done this like with the stripes going this way and I've done it with the stripes going this way and, and as far as I, I've never been able to tell the difference. Smack it into this volcano to kind of seal that edge right up against the wheel. Oh, a nice quiet wheel. <laughs> okay. So the whole key to throwing is your left elbow is anchored in your belly, so your arm doesn't get thrown all over the place. Leaning in, grabbing it here, coming up. So my first ceramics teacher taught me to center from side to side like that. And then somebody taught me to center from six o'clock, 12 o'clock up here. And I found that that way I can anchor my, use all my body weight behind it instead of using my shoulder strength, which I have none now. And I can feel this clay wanting to throw me all over the place because that brown clay is so much drier than the, um, the other clay. And the, the people that have all the super beautiful pottery and all these display cases, are you here? There are some amazing. Yep. Oh, I'm taking out. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> one of the potters. There is some amazing yeah. work out there in those display cases. Okay. And then I, I set my well with my thumbs. Some people do a finger and a thumb. Some people use their hands. I drop my thumbs down. <laughs> And then to spread the hole open, I call it the sea turtle. <laughs> so you pull the sea turtle's head toward you. That. Press the bottom down. You have a rule of thumb about how much clay you want to leave? On the bottom? If I'm making a bowl, I want to leave at least like a half an inch. Um, if I'm doing a vase, I would leave like a quarter inch. Rule of Rule of thumb is when you do a vase, you really don't trim. Yeah, I, I almost never flip a vase over and yeah. you know, trim, trim it. I'll just trim it up on the wheel and be done with it. Pull my walls up. My first pull is really just pushing the sponge up and in. Okay. So you're one of the potters? Actually, most of them are here, I think. Oh, nice. Okay. So grabbing that clay and bringing it up. And then I want to have a pretty narrow tall cylinder, so I'm going to just constrict it all in as I go. And then it's too tall to have my thumb out there, so I call this my Italian hand, like I'm speaking Italian. <laughs> <laughs> cylinder is dictated by how long you can hold your breath for.
And even though I'm always putting water back on it, I take water out of the inside because you don't want to build up a big lake on the inside. And then when you're like, what plagues most potters is their pots are heavy at the bottom. So the trick to that is you want to go in, you want to get that clay pushed up the wall. So I'll push out with my Italian hand and then I'll grab that chunk of clay. So it makes a little lump on the bottom. And if, I, if I'm on the inside, I can feel a groove right there. And then I'm just pinching that groove and bringing it up the wall. Where, where do you feel the groove? So it's inside. on the inside. Right. Uh, and it's right where my fingertips are, right there. So my sponge, you don't want to be way like this. Your sponge is across from your hand, but the pressure is at the bottom of that little lump as you're pushing it up. And so your Italian hand is at the top of the pressure. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately. Three hours of learning about using clay, and all we get out of it is the Italian <laughs> No, no, we're going to get much more. <laughs> right. How many pounds do you think you started with? Oh, I can wait it. Um, I would guess this was maybe maybe four or five pounds. You can kind of peek at your swirls. <coughs> Wow. Because Char's down in Costa Mesa selling her, yeah. her squirrel mugs. How thick is the wall when you're all done? Um, if I was just going to throw this and keep the, just the, the regular swirls in it, um, I would get it pretty thin, like um, you know, less than a quarter inch, um, maybe a quarter inch. But it actually, I kind of forgot what I was doing while I was talking. I should be leaving the walls a little thicker because I'm going to be faceting the sides. Yeah, so now I'm going to do a rib pull just using the rib instead of your sponge. So I'm going to go in with my Italian hand and come up with the rib. Can you make it just as tall as your arm is that you can reach in? Yeah, you can. You go up to your elbow, and then when you get past your elbow, you have to stand up and go to your shoulder. I don't know. We want to see you do this. Go to your elbow, you're pretty good. All right, well. There's a um, guy that used to work at Aardvark named Matt Evans, and he was a production potter, like his whole life. So his job was to you know, make 300 bowls one day and then, you know, make 100 lamps, blah, blah, blah. So he was just a machine on the wheel. And he came to school to demonstrate for the kids one day, and so he took a whole bag of porcelain, he threw it on the wheel, and the classes were 50 minutes, there's six classes in the day. And he threw a huge vase, just paper thin, out of this bag of porcelain. And then the bell rang, and as the kids left and new kids came in, he just crumpled it up on the wheel, oh. re wedged it, and then the new class he threw the same big giant face. It was like mind blowing. I couldn't believe it. <coughs> okay. So I've got my, my cylinder constricted in, which, which thickens the walls, and then that's going to give me a little bit of space to do what's called faceting. I'm gonna take my, let me get the slip off here again. I'm gonna take my wire tool and I'm gonna slice off little strips of bacon off the side of this. So the trick for this is, one, you leave your walls thicker, and 
two, you're just gonna have a little bit of wire between your thumbs and you're gonna feel the clay on your thumbs as you slide up and you wanna make sure your thumbs don't go apart and they don't come together, they're just straight like that. So I did a little notch on the bottom to get under the, the clay and then I'm gonna slide up and I'll draw like a little guideline where I'm gonna stop. Maybe I'll stop right about there. So I'm gonna slide up and take away. What are, you, what are you doing? Slide up. Slide up. Oh, <laughs> so I used to do this at Aardvark as a demonstration when I taught there. And I started calling it the Jesus Pot because you know you see like People will find like Jesus in their toast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden that toast is worth a million dollars. So if you did enough of these, eventually you'd see like a Jesus in your in your pot. <laughs> and all of a sudden, your know, pot's worth a million dollars. If you go downward when you're doing that, will it make those little loops? No, the little loops are just by how the clay is marbled together. And I go upward just because I don't want to put downward pressure on the wall. It's like Christmas, you never know what you're going to get. Exactly, yeah, it's different every time. So, how close are your thumbs together? Like this. Yeah, yeah. let me do it on your side. That would make sense. So, so my thumbs are like that, and I'm right on the, the sides, and I'm dragging my thumb on the clay just slightly just to feel it. So I kind of gauge the thickness with my thumb tips. And it takes out of them. Okay. Okay. Look for faces. <laughs> kind of a there's kind of a skull right there. <laughs> and then you could, um, this part up here, you could just leave it straight on the bottom and have a straight cylinder and turn this into like a, a rim of some sort. It could be a bottle or something. But if you want to stretch it out into a little bit of a, a vase shape, you can use, you can't touch the outside anymore. And I don't, do, do you, somebody have a flexible rib, like any kind of like a plastic rib? We have a rubber no, rib. we have all these things, but they're all in the okay. tool cabinet. Oh, I'll use this. I'll use the metal one. That's fine. Okay, so I'm going to go in with the clay going around like this, and I'll drop my rib down, and I'm going to stretch it out. But I can't touch this anymore, so I'm just going to hold the rim steady. So I'm going to go in. <coughs> and start pushing out the belly. This is where, like, if you cut it too thin in one spot, you find out really fast. <laughs> so the, the, the torque of the, the, the pressure of this makes it twist. So those lines will start to twist around. And if you left it, um, if you left your walls thick enough, you could really stretch this out wide. See, I've got a real thin spot right up there. Right in there, it's getting a little thin. As much as you want to touch the outside, you can. So I can feel it starting to get kind of thin in there, so I'll stop with the stretch in there. So it's a little flat at the bottom. Maybe I'll put the bottom on this a bit. And then for the top, you know, whatever you want that to do, I'm gonna cut off that uneven rim. Wobble. 
but maybe I want to like give it a little bit of a roll over here, bring it up and around. And a little chamois cloth on the rim to smooth it. So I usually I'll take a trimming tool and just trim the bottom end. <coughs> dent right in the middle there <coughs> that yeah. what about those curl the cue handles oh yeah the curl the cue handles would be perfect right there. <laughs>